Mr. President, members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before you and an honour to have been entrusted with the presentation of this part of South Africa's submissions. This is not a routine case. It's not even a routine case on the use of force or on international humanitarian law. South Africa is here because the Palestinian people are for genocide in Gaza and your previous orders have not succeeded in protecting them against that. The court held in January that the Palestinians have a legal right to protection against genocide and that South Africa had shown that there was a real and imminent risk to the irreparable violation of that right. The court issued an order because it considered it necessary to protect the Palestinian people against genocide. And it issued a further order in March. But whether because of a lack of clarity as to precisely what the orders require, or because Israel chooses to ignore them, they have not been effective. The United Nations has a framework, including the Security Council and the General Assembly, for addressing national disputes. But this part has not worked well in this case. And South Africa respectfully asks the court to reassert its authority and its role in this framework. South Africa has considered the technical legal requirements for provisional measures, changing the situation and so on, and will address them. But the essential point is that the court has the power to act to ensure that its previous orders and its eventual judgment will not be worthless and that the Palestinian people will be protected and that it needs to exercise that power now. Israel's action is directed against the Palestinian people throughout Gaza and the West Bank. South Africa's request was initially focused on Rafa because the imminent prospect of death and suffering on a massive scale resulting from Israel's attack. But since that request was made, it has become increasingly clear that Israel's actions in Rafa are part of the end game in which Gaza is utterly destroyed as an area capable of human habitation. This is the last step in the destruction of Gaza and its Palestinian people. It was Rafa that brought South Africa to the court, but it is all Palestinians as a national, ethnical and racial group who need the protection from genocide that the court can order. We've heard expressions of outrage that anyone could accuse Israel of, acting, Israel of acting in this way. We've heard assurances that Israel was doing everything in its power to avoid civilian deaths as it exercised its claimed right of self-defense. We've heard boasts that Israel's army is the most moral army in history. And we've heard denials that there is famine in Gaza. For months, People, particularly in the West, have appeared unwilling to accept that the accusations are true. How could people who look like us and sound like us possibly engage in anything like genocide? But the evidence has to be faced. My colleagues will take you to that evidence, including evidence of continued bombings, attacks on people in so-called safe areas to which they've been directed by Israel, attacks on aid convoys, and of mass graves and the horrors of which the corpses speak. There is no credible argument that this catastrophe is not real. The court has already found a real and imminent risk of the violation of the rights of the Palestinian people to protection against genocide. The court is aware 
of the statements of the United Nations Secretary General, of the President of the United States, of heads of state and foreign ministers from around the world, and of the heads of international aid agencies. They and the personal accounts and the news footage that emerges from Gaza tell a consistent story of unimaginable horror. And it continues as we speak. Most of Gaza has been razed. The survivors who are from time to time allowed to return to their homes are returning to rubble with no homes, no running water or electricity or sewage or other working infrastructure. And with the few possessions that they've managed to carry with them on carts or cars as they're pushed from one so-called safe area to the next. If the court does not act now, the possibility of rebuilding a viable Palestinian society in Gaza will be destroyed, at least for the lifetime of those who survive the current horrors of Gaza. The details are not always easy to verify because Israel continues to bar independent investigators and journalists from entering Gaza. And over 100 journalists who were in Gaza have been killed since the Israeli attacks began. But Israel cannot block investigations by independent investigators and then say that the court cannot proceed because there is insufficient evidence against it. The court has to deal with this case on the basis of its appraisal of the best evidence available to it. Israel may again invoke its claimed right of self, but it does not address three glaringly obvious, obvious points. First, the right of self-defense does not give a state a license to use unlimited violence. No right of self-defense can ever extend to a right to inflict massive indiscriminate violence and starvation collectively on an entire people. Second, nothing, not self-defense or anything else, can ever justify genocide. The prohibition on genocide is absolute, a peremptory norm of international law. Third, the court ruled in 2004 that there is no right of self-defense by an occupying state against the territory that it occupies. The key point today is that Israel's declared aim of wiping Gaza from the map is about to be realized. Further, evidence of appalling crimes and atrocities is literally being destroyed and bulldozed, in effect wiping the slate clean for those who've committed these crimes and making a mockery of justice. The court is not powerless, and South Africa submits with respect that it must do something to assert not only its own authority, but the authority of international law. South Africa submits that in order to secure the entry and distribution of food and humanitarian supplies and to save lives, a halt to Israeli military operations across Gaza is essential. The overwhelming weight of opinion among states and international organizations is the same. A halt to military operations in Gaza is necessary to comply with the previous orders that the court has already imposed. If Israel continues to deny that its bombing and shelling and military incursions and blocking of roads and entry points and its other military operations in Gaza are preventing the fulfillment of the court's orders, the court needs to spell it out explicitly for Israel 
and for the benefit of any other states that are still providing aid or assistance to Israel in its campaign to eradicate Palestine. These points will be developed, sir, by South Africa's Council. First, John Dugard will explain the jurisdictional and other preconditions to the exercise of the court's power to order provisional measures and demonstrate that they are met. Second, Max Duplessis will set out the recent events that have necessitated South Africa's return to the court, and particularly those concerning Rafa. Then Adila Hassan will explain the scale and imminence of the risk facing Palestinians in Gaza. And after that, Tembeka Kokutobi will show that Israel's actions have a pattern and an explicit purpose that clearly indicates that the aim is to eradicate Palestine. And finally, Lina Negrawli will explain the remedies that South Africa seeks. And the agent will return to read out South Africa's prayer for relief. That, Mr. President, members of the court, concludes my part of this submission, and I thank you for your attention.